Hi, I'm Judith Dreyer. Thank you for joining me for this podcast series, The Holistic Nature of Us. My intent is to take us, you and I, into a better understanding of the concepts behind our holistic nature and how that ties directly to the holistic nature of the world around us. How can we connect the dots in practical ways that we are nature and nature's in us? I will be featuring authors and educators, practitioners and others whose passion for this earth helps us create bridges. We'll see what's trending, what's relevant to our world today, not just for land use, but to connect the dots between ourselves and nature. It's time for practical action and profound inner change so our natural world is valued once again. And today I am delighted to introduce you to Jen Fry. She is a healer, a mentor, an earth advocate, and voice of the plants. She's the founder of Heart Springs Sanctuary, where she helps people deepen their connection with nature through plant communication. She's also a certified uh, plant uh, flower essence practitioner, a certified plant spirit healing uh, practitioner. So, Jen, welcome. I'm delighted to have you here today. Thank you, Judith. My pleasure. I'm so grateful for the work you're doing. Um, thank you. Uh, we all want to get the word out, right, that this world Absolutely. is worth taking care of. So you talk, You have uh, many things that you do in the plant world besides plant essences. You're a healer. You also have consultations. You help folks. And you work with music. Um, but let's start with uh, communication with plants. And what does that mean to you? Yeah, so... Communicating with plants this is something I teach to everyone, and I believe this is uh, it's something that we come into this world knowing how to do. The plants want to communicate with us, and but for most of us, we've been culturalized that this is something we can't do, or you have to be special, or you have to be um, trained over you know your lifetime before you can actually communicate. And the truth of the matter is, is that plants communicate all the time to us and in many different ways. Sometimes it's with their scent, sometimes it's with a feeling, sometimes um, it's with a, we're just walking and suddenly um, something pops into our head that we wouldn't have thought of before. Um, so this is what I do with my students is I train them on the biggest step is to get into your heart space and to um, really be centered so that you can be receptive. So I train them how to do that and I train them on um, broadening our perspective. Because when we talk about communicating with plants, so often people immediately go to like Moses and the burning bush. You know, they mm -hmm. think that it's gonna be this voice. Mm -hmm. Ken, you left the stove on. Or, right, you know, <laughs> that's funny, but it's true. It is, it is. And really, just like, you know, you and I right now, we're communicating with our voices, but we also communicate with um, our physical gestures and and the energy you know you can have somebody walk into a room and you just automatically know what's going on um, without them ever saying something to us and that's the same thing with the plants that they also communicate actually I think on a wider variety than humans do because they have this ability and intelligence to communicate um, on a broader spectrum hmm. That's very interesting. I, I, I think of, my first thought is children. You know, I think of them first, that they have this innate ability to do that if they were trained, you know? Well, many children don't even need to be trained. Mm -hmm. So I feel like they come in knowing that. It's just, then they get um, so-called schooled, you know? So they get told that you can't communicate with plants. But um, I've talked with, well, not talked, I've taught students about plant communication. And when I say taught, it's, nothing. I simply would ask, sit by this dandelion and tell me what you think. And they have no um, herbal experience, you know, no prior knowledge. And they sit down and they come back and they tell me exactly how the dandelion is used in the herbal community. And they tell me exactly like, oh, I sit with the dandelion and I feel so joyful. Or I feel this energy right in my belly, which is the solar plexus. That's the chakra dandelion supports, you know, it's like, yeah, they they get it, but over time, and there are adults that keep that alive themselves. Mm -hmm. But over time, we generally, you know, lose that that skill. Though we can always regain it. 
That's true, and I know herbal programs are very good at helping us to reconnect with the plants on whatever level. I often think of the stories, and I've experienced this myself, where you walk in a field and everything is deadly still. But there's this one little plant that's kind of waving at you, you know, and why is that happening? Could it be a mouse in the ground? I mean, our mind goes to all these different things, but uh, the, the, the gift in it is that it awakens us to the fact that there's more out there than we've been taught to believe. Absolutely. And yeah, that plant waving is saying, hey, Judith, I want to connect with you. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like that at times. It really does. Um, so tell us more about your work with flower essences and how you uh, approach the intelligence in plants. Yeah, so, um, well, okay, how I approach the intelligence in plants, it's that's a huge subject. So, you know, plant intelligence has kind of become the 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 hip word right now you know there's a whole lot of energy behind it um there's actually a whole field called plant neurobiology right now stefano mancuso in um, florence italy he's one of the pioneers he wrote the book brilliant green and prior to that back in the 70s it was cleve baxter who really started bringing up this idea in the scientific community that plants are intelligent um Though for people who work with plants and of course for the indigenous communities, this is the information we've always known, that plants are intelligent, plants have so much to offer us, and all we have to do is listen. And um, and their intelligence is different than ours. So everyone goes to, but they don't have a brain. Um, but as the work of Stefano Mancuso and the other scientists are showing, mm -hmm. they, they don't have a center, and that's actually a benefit to them because they are able to receive information in a much wider variety of ways than we can and transmit it. And so because they are stationary, though some plants do move, just a little <laughs> slower than human scale, um, on a whole they're considered to be stationary. So they have to learn how to manage with the environment that they're given. And they've developed other school, other skills that help them to um, adapt and change. And, you know, if, if bugs are coming at them, they can't run away and hide inside. Mm -hmm. They have to create defense mechanisms to protect them for a bug infestation. And they do. They, you know, like they'll change their chemical constituents. They'll um, change, like tobacco plants will change their bloom from night to daytime you know they're really like incredible and um and we just have so much to learn from them um and can really help us in these like huge changing times <laughs> how to how to adapt and learn to work together because that's you know one of plants great skills is community and working together yeah, and I don't think that that is stressed enough, but like you said, there's some new research coming out. I just picked up The Hidden Life of Trees mm -hmm. uh, by the German author, and I'm so impressed with the level of communication. And what makes me sad recently is that I, I saw a hill, I don't know how many acres it was, but there were beautiful oak trees there. And mm -hmm. as Doug Tallamy says, an oak tree will support over 500 species of critters. And they were completely taken down so okay. that uh, apartment buildings could go in. But based mm -hmm. on the hidden life of trees, where were the mother trees in there, the grandmother trees in there? And that completely disrupts the entire mm -hmm. ecosystem community that's mm -hmm. been living there for I don't know how many years, you know. And that kind of thing, um, I would like to see us create a different awareness about building so that we can keep these forest communities in in some kind of um, not only respect for them but in a sustainable way so that the forest ecology system doesn't get shattered because that's what happened. It gets shattered. And what I found is with the existing apartments there, it actually was very sterile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I saw three species of birds. That's it. Right. Cro crows and blue jays and maybe some sparrows mm -hmm. and squirrels. And I didn't see any other wildlife. Right. Yeah. As, as you said, you know, cutting down one tree has a huge impact on the surrounding environment. And 
that doesn't mean like we can't cut down trees, you right. know, like right. one of my dear friends, she lives on the base of a mountain and they totally clear cut it. And this is a place that I had done ceremony for years on and I, I can feel it in my heart. And when I go there, it's so sad. And, and yet I buy wood for my house. Mm -hmm. So I know that, but there is a way that we can manage um, working with the plants and working with the forest. And if we listen to the trees, they can help us with that because they, they really do want to, um, want to give. And they know they have certain roles in our lives. You know, they know that they provide shelter for us and they know they provide food for us. Um, it's, but it's right now, it's pretty much a one way relationship. And, and nobody wants to be in that kind of a relationship with somebody who's just take, 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 take. Um, right. What the plants want us to do is to come back into what I call or what is called that co-creative partnership where we're also giving. And so if we can communicate with them, if we can pay attention to their intelligence, then we can do that with ease and we can see what's in the highest good for all of us. Because as you're saying, like, in my opinion, living in a sterile environment isn't isn't great. You know, I I like to look out and see the animals and see the other plants growing around me. That's our medicine. Um, they provide so much for us. So um, so yeah, it's not to our benefit to just clear cut. And I mean, we know this, right? We're seeing yes. it in the global warming and everything else. We know what it does to cut a forest. And um, you know, the best way to uh, well, there are many ways to look for. Uh, healing from global warming, but we know having an intact forest and having that soil be so healthy, both the trees bringing in the extra carbon and the soil just absorbs that carbon too. It's it's just a better situation for everyone. It is. It is. And I'm so glad you brought that up because we, we forget that we have a relationship with trees, even if we're not aware of it. They give us oxygen, and we give them carbon dioxide, and they help sequester that carbon and bring it back into the soil instead of it being released into the atmosphere. So if we go back to this apartment complex that was being built, and then all these trees were taken down, that's a huge amount of carbon that was released into the atmosphere instead of bringing it back down. But we, you and I both know that people are making a difference with replanting trees and trying to create healthier uh, communities. And even if it's one yard at a time, it's, it's happening on those levels. And the other point is trees live longer than we do, so their vibrational energy is different from ours. And that's what brings the skepticism in, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, anytime you say energy, yes. <laughs> it brings skepticism. Um, just because, you know, our science is starting to catch up. Mm -hmm. So we are having, like, for instance, Stefano Mancuso. And there are other people, too, that are starting to study the vibrations. And, like, the science is catching up. But for the longest time, we didn't have scientific machines that were able to measure vibration or energy. Um, and that's one of the great um, aspects of the work of Cleve Baxter because he started to. He started, um, you know, he's a he was an expert with the lie detector test. And just by accident, he um, did a study on a plant and noticed that the plant was responding to his um, reactions. And that was the beginning. I mean, it's still not quite vibration or energy, but it's showing that plants interact with us and it showed the plants are intelligent. And yeah, our science is starting to catch up. It's going to get better. And then it'll be easier to like put aside the skepticism. But the people who work day to day with the plants, we know, you know, the vibration of a tree is different than my vibration and it, and it benefits, you know, having a tree, at my in my yard I can stop at that tree before I come home and just get centered in my heart so like any of that stress that I was carrying through the day it's gone so I can come back into my family and greet them with an open heart rather than focusing on you know whatever crisis was happening at work mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, that's a good point. And also, you do music with the plants. So you talked about some of the science, some of the, the technology that's sort of catching up with what our ancient ancestors knew as a given. We can okay. now see the, re, the uh, connecting the dots with the science and that knowledge. So tell us more about your uh, work with music with the plants. Yeah, so um, I first learned about music with the plants um, 
over five years ago. And I had heard about this device. And then my first experience actually was in Ireland. And I was there doing a ceremony with hawthorn plants. And we were each um, working with a particular hawthorn tree and playing our instruments for the tree and singing to the tree. And all of a sudden, I heard the most angelic music I've ever heard. And I was just like, I need to go check that out. <laughs> so I apologize to my tree. I'm sorry. I'll come back to you. And I went and I just followed the music. And meanwhile, I saw everybody else who was in our group. They were all doing the same thing. <laughs> it was just like this beacon. And we show up and here it was a hawthorn tree that was connected to this instrument we call music of the plants device. And this tree had never played before. It's the first time it was hooked up. A friend of mine was who was along um, had a flute and he started playing with the tree and the tree responded and then um, our teacher's son brought out his guitar and then she started drumming and it was like if you closed your eyes you were listening to a quartet I mean, mm -hmm. and, and it was just like a jam session you know sometimes the tree would lead sometimes somebody wow. else and it was so beautiful so at that moment, I knew I needed to have one of these devices, had no idea how I would ever work with it or what I would do, but I had to have one. And um, and since then, it's just been this magical journey. Um, now I'm the U.S. distributor for these, and um, I get to work with people all the time. So this device actually came out of that work of Cleve Baxter. So while I've been working with it for five years, Domin, it comes from an eco society in Domin sorry, in Italy called Dom and Her. And one of their main goals is to connect humans and nature and really heal this divide, knowing that um, the survival of humans is dependent on this. So, go ahead. No, no, that's, a, that's another dot. We don't realize that uh, whether we like nature or not, we need nature. Oh, absolutely. You know? I mean, Plants, in I mean, all of nature, yes, but in particular plants, because if all the plants die, we need oxygen, you know, like they, they provide the, our breath of life. But yes, all of nature, because you can't really separate out one thing or right. another. Right. Um, but yeah, so Dom and her started, they knew about the work of Cleve Baxter and were so inspired. And they just created all different types of devices. Um, some were robots that the plant, they would hook the plant up to electrodes and the plant could determine the way that the robot moved. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And so the plant, they would actually sit the plant on the robot so the plant could determine where he wanted to move. And the plant would always go towards the sun. Hmm. Other experiments, they had plants control. In Dom and Her, they have, they call it nucleo. So they live in different communities. And each nucleo has a gate. And so the plant could control the opening and closing of that gate. And the plant would only open it for the people who lived in that nucleo. So, yeah. These are like. Isn't that amazing? Incredible. So incredible. So out of that, then they created this device called the Music of the Plants, where a plant is connected. It's basically a biofeedback machine. And if the device reads the electrical impulse between the leaf and the root, and each possible value within a certain range is assigned a note. And so the plants, we get to hear them sing. And like the really cool thing about this is that the plants learn how to play this device. Um, and they remember. How so, about that? Yeah. Tell me more. This is so interesting. You know, I, I think we have this amazing um, opportunity right now to, to click on YouTube and we can see some of this, but it still isn't mainstream. Right. It's becoming more and more popular, though. I will say that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and it, one, one of the things I love about this program is, as I said earlier, when I teach my plant communication classes, you know, I have to work with people to overcome their limitations to help them realize that they're receiving messages from the plants and with this device we just plug it in i mean i have to do some work with the plants ahead of time so that because you know not every plant wants to be a performer first of all <laughs> oh they're that's like, interesting <laughs> who, who would know huh <laughs> it's an experiment let me tell you but um so, you know, while I have to work with the plants ahead of time, once we have a good singer who wants to perform, I just have to turn it on. And everybody's able to hear that the plants are communicating with us. And what I've discovered is that 
it, that opens their heart in a way that most people have never had their heart opened. Mm -hmm. And so it's a common occurrence that people will start to cry. Mm -hmm. And because they recognize, you know, it awakens in them mm -hmm. this ancient memory of mm -hmm. our connection with plants. Mm -hmm. And several people have told me, I know this song. I've heard the song all my life, but like they didn't realize what the song was. Um, yeah. So it's just an incredible experience. And oh, it has to be so inspiring for you and rewarding for you too to be that facilitator, you know? Oh, it's totally is. That's one of the reasons why I'm so glad I do it <laughs> because I get to see. It's so great to just see that awakening and that realization that plants are intelligent and and most of all, that they want to communicate with us. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, my healing work, it's also just wonderful in, like, the effects that it's had on people's lives. And, and being the distributor, I have, um, the like, the bonus of hearing all the incredible ways that people work with this device because mm -hmm. people are way more creative than I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm not a technology person, so... Uh, you know, it took me a lot to learn how to work with the device. Now I now I have it down so it's easy and I can help anybody. But at the beginning, I prayed that none of my knobs would move. Like <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. Do you have a favorite plant that uh, a, a favorite plant music, I should say, a plant that really uh, stirs your heart in particular? Um okay, so no. <laughs> no. That's like asking a person if they have a favorite child. And maybe oh, some okay, I get it. But, you know, like the plants that I work with the most, um, particularly because they're they're really good performers. And, again, for me and my work, mm -hmm. that's important because I, nobody wants to go to a plant concert and have a plant be silent. Right. Um, so for the average person, it's not a big deal. They can have any plant they play. Mm -hmm. um, but the plants I work with the most are Tulsi, and Tulsi is just, or Holy Basil, mm -hmm. just a sweet, sweet song. And Begonia. Begonia is another, mm -hmm. like, really incredible. And so when I said plants learn, there are certain plants that when you turn them on the first time, they're immediate singers, and they're just incredible. And Begonia tends to be that way. Mm -hmm. um, orchids are another one that tends to just be an immediate singer. Um, cause they're kind of like divas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> uh, wow. This is so interesting. All right. So let's, what would you say to people? Um, what kind of tips based on this discussion would you share with our listeners, um, in terms of plant intelligence, communication, uh, the music that work that you do? So one, you know, do it. <laughs> you just go out in nature and, you know, be open. Um, if you can, learn how to get into your heart space, which honestly the easiest step is gratitude. Just focusing on what you're grateful for really opens you up to that receptive state. Mm -hmm. um, also, practicing good energy hygiene is really important. And when we do that, it just clears away all the static and the filters that it takes for the plants or whoever has to work through to get to us. And uh, before you go on, how would how would you recommend somebody do that who's never done this before? Yeah, so that's what I was just going to say. I actually have an ebook on my website, so people can um, download that, and um, and it gives lots of great information. It's only snippets, you know. There's so much more, but common ones are smudging. Um, honestly, being in nature itself. So mm -hmm. you know, just being in nature will help clear your energy hygiene, and then you're present with the plants, and you can communicate. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are more advanced stages, like doing a plant limpia or an egg limpia, or working with practitioners, but it's all just about clearing our energy so that, one, that helps us get into that receptive state more easily. Mm -hmm. um, and two, like I said, if, if our energy is like all staticky and chaotic, that's just a big filter. It's insulation that whatever it is we want to receive, whether it's connecting with a person or connecting with a plant, they all have to work hard to get through that. Mm -hmm. So the easier we can clear that or the more we can clear that, the easier it is for um for us to receive the information that we really want to receive and that we need to receive. <laughs> we don't always want to receive it. <laughs> well, hopefully we want to so that we can strengthen our communication with nature and then we'll have, we'll grow a different level of respect. And like you said, you know, our society has been very egocentric 
And one of my um, podcast guests stresses we want to be eco-centric, you know, where we really respect the land again and make that our focus instead of take, take, take and me, me, me kind of a mentality, which hopefully we are getting away from. Right. Absolutely. And that would be the third tip that I would say is reciprocity. Um, You know, what you're saying is that take, 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 and we're not giving back. And just little, little efforts as far as, you know, um, tradition is tobacco. Um, beads are another great thing. I give um, chocolate sometimes to plants. Mm-hmm. Or I, I ask the plant, what is it that you would like? And sometimes I sing them a song or I write them a poem. Sometimes I dance with the plants. Um, you know, it's whatever, whatever we can give that's from our heart to the plants of reciprocity, recognizing the incredible gifts they give to us. Um, that really helps strengthen this communication and connection. And it brings us back into that co-creative partnership. We're closer to that rather than the one-sided relationship. We actually have a two-way relationship. Mm. Thank you for that because that's the point of the podcast series is to inspire people to get back into a co-creative relationship with nature. And we can do it one yard at a time. We can put different species in our front yard and in our backyard. Front yard gardens are becoming more popular, more accepted. People are actually speaking up against ordinances. They're changing the uh, face of their community because we're speaking up differently now uh, in terms of you know what we're doing with nature. Well, Jen, this has been wonderful. Um, I know our listeners would like your contact information. Yeah. So before I do, I just want to say one more point that you brought up. So that's a good point is that we don't need to go out to some, like, we don't need to go to Yosemite. We don't need to go to the tropical islands to, like, have this experience. The best way to connect and communicate with plants is to start at who is at your back door or your front door, you know, or who is on your windowsill. So we can just start with this, with the every day is so much better than making this some huge, grandiose thing. It's just those small, everyday actions. This, well, what is On that level, one of the things that my native elders have taught me is that whatever we need, too, is usually right beneath our feet. And I have stories myself about that. And people are looking for something and they have an ailment. And then they tell me, when I tell them the plant, they go, oh, my God, it's in my front yard. And they had no idea about it. So it's about paying attention, too, Mm -hmm. and having patience uh, to to listen, it doesn't take. It may not be in the moment. It might be over time because we've we've walked it, we've sat with them, and we've gotten to know them on their terms in a way, not on our terms. Absolutely, yeah, totally agree. And yes, I too have so many stories about that. <laughs> it's funny. All right, so how about your contact information? Yes, so my contact information is the best way would be to go to my website, which is www.bridgetsway.com. It's spelled B R I G I D S W A Y dot com. And from there, you can have my Facebook. You, I have a newsletter. Again, that ebook for um, energy hygiene is there. And um, but Instagram, you can access YouTube. You can access all my accounts. My cell phone is there, so you can also feel free to call me or text me. Um, yeah, and email me. That's wonderful. Well, I want to tell the listeners that I do have another treat for them uh, today with this podcast and uh, at. When we're done, uh, you will be able to listen to music from the plants. So thank you, everyone, for joining us at Holistic Nature of Us. And I hope you feel as inspired as I do by my discussion with Jen, her practical advice. And I'm really grateful. This is uh, Judith Dreyer at the Garden's Gate. My book and blog are available on my website, judithdreyer.com. I always like to end with a quote from Paul Hawken. He's an environmentalist and author who reminds us, Sustainability, ensuring the future life on Earth, is an infinite game, the endless expression on behalf of all. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. 